Well, I hope you're having a good day, everyone, and that things are going well. We are now on Module 7, or at least you are, and um, this is going to be about a very, very interesting topic, one that has, in the past couple of months here, as I record this in early 2023, has literally exploded onto the scene of the high-tech world, and that's the topic of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, lifelong learning and machine learning and of course the artificial intelligence engine chat gpt has come out and has made all kinds of different waves and uh, so this is a very important topic for us and uh, as we sit here today it's my belief that we are literally at the edge of a new frontier that is going to have profound impact on the way people do business on the way people learn and as a result, as a technology leader, I believe it's incumbent upon uh, you to make sure that you are aware of it, that you have a working understanding of it. And all we're going to be able to do today is try to give you a flyover and help kind of separate out some of the different pieces. Because if you read in the literature or you just go out and read articles, they're not always 100% clear on uh, how some of the different pieces uh, interact and, and how they play. And, and so we'll, we'll take a look at that today. So what are these things? You know, people use the term artificial intelligence. And on one level, AI is kind of a large umbrella term. And underneath that umbrella, there are different kinds of what we call artificial intelligence. There is AI under AI, and then there is lifelong learning. And you can see these on the slide and machine learning. And they're, each one is a little different. If you're talking about not the generic umbrella term artificial intelligence, uh, rather sort of the specific application that is called AI, then what we're referring to is mach creating machines that can simulate human intelligence. And what we want is machines that can perform tasks that require human intelligence, something like understanding natural language or recognizing images or sifting through complex data to pick out certain parts that are relevant. And so we're trying to write systems that can do that. That's a little bit different than the lifelong learning systems. These are machines that can go through data and learn from it. They, um, one level you can kind of think of it as if they are learning, uh, recognizing trends and correlations. Um, another way you can think of it is that they are looking for um, solutions to interesting problems that people have proposed to the system. So the system is targeted to go through and try to figure out how to accomplish something. And we'll call lifelong learning because they look at large, large amounts of data set. Now they're not limited to being able to learn from experience as well, but they, they typically start with a large data set. And I've got an example here of a, of a lifelong learning model that was called AlphaGo. And in 2016, it was fed a large, a huge um, data set of Go games. And if you're not familiar with Go, it's a Chinese game. It's very popular around the world in which you play stones on the board and uh, try to avoid being captured and try to uh, win sort of a real estate game. It's a very complex game. And even though the rules are quite simple, it turns out to be a difficult game to program intelligence into. Well, the Alpha Go system learned from a huge data set of Go games, what worked and what didn't work. And then it also used these, these um, some machine learning techniques after the fact. And it was the uh, first language learning, I'm sorry, lifelong learning model that was able to beat one of the world's top Go players in five games. And so this was considered kind of a breakthrough in the world of artificial intelligence that somebody had trained a system and it could now win games better. It had essentially gone through the data and learned what worked and what didn't work. And what it's, again, what it's really doing is it's really identifying correlations and uh, recognizing patterns. And uh, this is quite powerful. And it's, it is similar to the way um, people often learn. We learn from experience. We try something, it didn't work. And we say, I'm not going to do that next time, or I'm going to try to avoid that. We put a, in our own minds, we, we put a, marker on it that says didn't work very well. You know, I'm try something different next time. Of course, we have a lot of <laughs> emotions. And uh, so sometimes we make decisions based on uh, other other motivations and uh, machines, quote unquote, won't do that. 
it'll be interesting to see. We'll talk about some of the biases that work their way into these systems and the biases and how they get in there. Finally, we have the ML version of artificial intelligence. And this is a machine that can improve its performance on a specific task through experience. And uh, machine learning is something that, you know, it's, it's, you think, well, how much can it learn? Well, we can turn a machine loose, a computer loose, and have it try a specific task billions of times. And in that, it can continuously refine and learn from its mistakes. And so um, there have been, uh, I mentioned here that I'm actually referring to the AlphaGo system because after it read the huge data set using the lifelong learning techniques, it then began using machine learning techniques to learn from its failures and apply weights. When I was in uh, college a uh, long time ago, when I was an undergrad, there was on the local Unix system where most of us worked, it was a, tie, it was a share um, multi-user system, it wasn't a dedicated laptop like most of us use today. Anyway, when I went through that, we had a, an AI, quote unquote AI, it was an early AI, and it played four dimensional tic-tac-toe in a four by four cube. Your goal was to get four in a row somehow in this uh, three, three dimensional cube. And uh, the system started out, it couldn't do anything. It barely, it, all it knew was the rules of the game. But every time you played it, it would learn from its mistake. And within three or four games of playing you, it already became an extremely talented opponent. And after, if you kept playing it, you would eventually get to a place where it was extremely difficult to build. And this was a machine learning kind of application. It, lear it started out with no knowledge really about what made good and bad plays. It would try anything randomly. And then it would also recognize what you were doing. And it would use that to weight its decisions. And uh, once it started weighting decisions and outcomes, it began to build an intelligent tree of possible choices. And it knew, knew over each game it played, it knew better and better how to put a sign of value to what the eventual outcome might be. Quite impressive, and that was a long time ago. What we have now is much, much, much more complex and much better than that. I have posted a couple of um, videos. By now, you will know that I always try to post two or three or four videos for you uh, that can provide some additional information. But there's um, a video on there about AI is weird, and I'd like to encourage you to watch that. It's a wonderful little TED Talk. And in it, the uh, woman who gives the speech, if I'm, uh, the woman who gives the speech, uh, really talks about some of the strange outcomes that AI has produced. And the point of that really is to gain an understanding of how the, of the fact that AI isn't thinking, you know, quote unquote, like we do. All it's doing is trying all of the different possibilities. And because we don't always know how to set the boundaries up, it will come up with some answers that are not reasonable. They're not what we're looking for. They're very strange. And uh, it's, I think it's a good one for you to watch because it'll give you an idea of, of, the bound, of how important it is to have boundaries in AI thinking. Anyway, so these are the three types that you will typically hear about. Uh, machines that perform tasks that are where we're trying to build in human-like intelligence, lifelong learning that learns from huge data sets, and machine learning which learns from experience. There are a lot of benefits. I was asked by a student just yesterday an undergrad here at Oklahoma Christian, and the student asked me how I felt about AI. And um, maybe I'm just an op maybe I'm just an optimist, uh, but I think that AI is an incredibly exciting technology. And sorry about that. That was my phone. Uh, sorry about that. I think AI is an incredibly uh, amazing technology. It's uh, going to offer us tremendous productivity improvements. I've been in a conversation in the last two weeks with another faculty member who is concerned about job elimination. And certainly I think AI is going to change jobs. It's going to make people more productive. Uh, it's going to enable a lot of things to be done automatically that weren't previously possible in the computer world. And now let's take that back and think about what that may mean for a business or an organization. Uh, think about how much productivity improvements can go on. And that's what AI is going to be. AI is going to be very much a productivity improver over time. Now, obviously, people can use it for nefarious ends as well. I have no doubt that uh, many, many of my students are already using it to help with their homework. 
I have a freshman level programming class that I teach. And uh, I recently went to ChatGPT and fed it uh, an advanced program that I'm having my students write. And it just popped. It gave me a program that worked great. So my students could say, hey, my productivity was increased because I gave uh, had ChatGPT write the program for me. And I know that that kind of thing is going on and it is uh, currently difficult to detect. And uh, the only thing that, you know, that I can say is, well, if a student does that, they are not learning what they need to learn and they will eventually will catch up with them. But given the sort of cheating that can go on with that, that is uh, one side, maybe a downside, but there are huge upsides, I think. Um, I've got a couple here. Um, you know, AI can uh, automate um, a lot of mindless and tedious tasks. You think about data entry. Um, there are already systems being built that can use character recognition software, cameras, and language models. And with AI, we can extract data from various sources and automatically enter the data. I saw a TED Talk um, just last fall in which the author demonstrated, and this was several years old, how AI learned within a very, very quick time, began to learn and understand the Chinese language. And then they connected it to some other language models. And um, the person was able to give a speech live and it was translated. You say, well, that kind of thing has been going on for a while. Well, this also learned that person's vo voice and intonations and it gave the speech in his voice in Chinese, which I found just absolutely fantastic. You know, think about the possibilities for communication and uh, how that could help people uh, communicate with each other and work together. So that's that's the kind of thing that it can do. It can take over looking for human errors. If AI is trained to recognize correctness and incorrectness in large data sets, um, it could uh, inspect that. Think about the benefits in healthcare that I've noted here, you know, um, patient data, a lot of the mistakes that happen in the healthcare system are a result of simple data entry errors. Well, if you had an AI system that could look through and identify potential errors like that and flag them, uh, that would save that from having to be done by a human so that the human could focus on correcting uh, this data and making sure working with the doctors and the nurses and the other people in the system to make sure that that data was correct. We also know already that we're interacting with simple AI systems. And I think that um, with the advent of ChatGPT, we will soon see much, much more complex chat systems and customer service systems that will actually be able to draw on huge data sets within a company's pro internal data and then be able to help uh, customers solve problems that they're having without having to involve a, uh, a human until you start yelling at the phone. I want to talk to an agent. I want to talk to an agent. <laughs> All right. So those are the benefits. Um, AI has already been used to create a lot of improvements. There are AI powered shopping assistants. Now it's up to you whether you want to trust those or not. I think AI powered shopping assistants could be very effective at guiding you and um, sort of shepherding you into purchases that maybe you wouldn't have made otherwise. Uh, there's there's an article I read that talks about AI being used by the Uber uh, rideshare program. And it's, of course, you know, Google already has looked at traffic for a long time, but uh, Uber is apparently taking this to another level with having AI to analyze traffic and figure out under the covers what's going on without having direct access to that information and then create better routes for the drivers. Of course, we have self-driving vehicles and uh, have here, will you ever use one? I've been asked that several times over the last few years. And uh, I think there will come a time if I live long enough that I will probably, yes, I will be comfortable using them. And I actually think that once we turn the corner and have more self-driving cars than not self-driving cars, we may see a reduction in the uh, accident rates because the we may see ways in which the cars themselves can warn each other uh, through different uh, signaling and censoring kinds of things. Of course, we already talked about ChatGPT, and we'll mention a little bit more about that. Um, I want you to look at the white papers and links. Um, particularly, I have a blog that I read by an economist named Tyler Cohen. And this is one of the things that you should be doing as well, is sort of developing your own resources. Some blog writers and uh, authors who you read their, their input on a regular basis. Give yourself a library. Uh, good leaders do this. And uh, make sure that you're doing that. Uh, so I've linked Tyler Cohen's blog. It's called The Marginal Revolution. 
and it's really unusual. He's quite the thinker. He covers a lot of different material in his blog, but one of the things that he's very interested in is AI, and this is what initially drew me to Tyler Cohen's blog. Um, and he, he, he links stories almost every day that discuss new advances, new discoveries, or interesting ways in which people have pushed AI. And I would encourage you to bookmark that one and look at it every so often. And the link is in the white papers links on Blackboard. Now, there are a number of challenges with AI. And the number one thing that people are concerned about, and I think it's very valid, is how, how do we prevent bi, um, bi bias from sneaking in? See, one of the things that we sometimes can be blind to is that the, the data that we feed it may have trends in it that we don't realize, and those trends may be biased in some way. Now, maybe they're biased for a reason. Now, one example that uh, is in perhaps one of the videos I shared with you is a system where they let an AI system look at um, a huge number of uh, precancerous and post-cancerous um, MRI images. And uh, what it got to a point was it, was it could reliably diagnose cancer in many cases that a physician, human physician would miss. And one thing that it did that was just absolutely incredible in my opinion, was it recognized a linkage between a, a particular cell formation that uh, humans who've been looking at these things for years and years had never recognized, but it recognized a correlation that if it saw this, then that was highly probable to be leading to cancer. So the AI's learning and analysis actually identified a new way to identify cancer earlier in patients through these MRIs. And that's the kind of thing that, um, see that was a, you could call that a bias because it recognized a trend, but it was in the data, we just didn't see it. That's not the kind we're worried about. What we're more worried about is um, the idea that there will be hidden biases in there which are um, unfair to uh, different groups of people. or uh, and, and so we just cannot afford to have that happen in our systems. And so we're gonna have to be very careful to make sure that the training data that goes into these systems is good and fair. And, and we may have to adjust, you know, to make sure that it's not there. In the European Union, I think they're a little bit ahead of us here in America. And we'll note that in a little bit um, about making regulations uh, about AI. They're already starting to think about that. And uh, so they have recognized that they don't want to have bias in their systems, and they're thinking about how they can prevent that. Uh, the old phrase that's been around since I very the very first time I sat down in the computer is garbage in, garbage out. And it's true now more than ever. The only difference is we can have lots and lots of garbage. And if we have garbage in our data, then we will get garbage out of our uh, systems. I have an example here that I read about a couple of years ago where they were building an AI system and they wanted it to try to look through resumes to try to find the best resume. So they fed it all these resumes, you know, and, and then it knew the outcomes from those. And what it ended up doing was it actually ended up deciding that, well, any resume that has information that indicates that the resume was a woman's resume, it would actually filter it out. And so it, in, it introduced an unintended bias and also uncovered a trend that had been in the data that had been given. So both things needed to be fixed, right? We can't have that. Um, and it was kind of an eye opener to the people who trained the system. Oh, look at this, this is quite bad. Uh, so that's one thing we want. We have to be aware of, and you must be aware of the bias uh, that can creep into it. The other thing that is uh, we want transparency and explicability. People should be able to understand how the results were arrived at. They should be able to see the, how the dots were connected. That's the transparency part. And someone should be able to explain it. We don't want to create systems where we don't understand the linkage because then it's difficult for us to justify the answers and ensure that they are correct and fair. Obviously, AI systems are going to have access to large amounts of personal data. Uh, and that's going to happen in a lot of different spheres, not just the healthcare system that I've mentioned here. And those must be protected from direct or indirect exposure. Finally, um, one of the big challenges, and this is where you as a leader will come in as you uh, grow into these different roles, is AI technologies are, are definitely complex. Their implementation and their application are not a trivial activity. 
So different organizations are going to have to either develop expertise in how to implement or limit, or even if they don't implement or limit their own, they're going to have to have expertise in how they can use it. If they don't, I think they're going to suffer competitive disadvantage, uh, which is going to be very serious for organizations that you'll be involved in over time. And that expertise is, I think, going to be expensive to develop. In fact, uh, one of the things that I think uh, a person could focus on if they were, say, in their 20s right now would be, say, I'm going to be an AI expert and I will be in demand in four or five years and uh, maybe be able to command a, a high salary or um, a good position of leadership inside a technical leadership in a company. So what's next for AI? Well, I think we're going to see increased automation. Uh, we're going to see transportation, not just uh, Uber drivers automated and truck drivers across the country. I think we're going to see a lot of different kinds of uh, movement, like you, you might start seeing uh, AI drones and things like that. Just just think creative, creatively, and the, the opportunities are endless for where this thing could go. I already mentioned um, medical diagnoses, but what if we start having AI systems that can work around the clock and are available at distance? Oh, that could be fantastic for third world countries that uh, don't have excellent healthcare facilities, the ability maybe to get assistance from an AI system. And that could really be wonderful and make a huge different in, difference in uh, places where it's difficult to get to or there aren't enough uh, healthcare resources. Um, AI systems could become better at emulating uh, human interaction. And as a result, we will have more personal AI interactions. I think we're going to see more natural language processing and more improvements in computer vision. There's an article I posted on um, one of the white papers that talk about this. It's really, it's, it's not just recognizing, you know, different objects. It's able to solve visual puzzles. That's amazing to me. And we're just, at, at, it's just amazing. We're at an inflection point. It's fantastic. And I think the last thing that we really need to be thinking about going forward is we really need to focus on the ethics of AI and regulation of AI. And I, I do think that, I'm not a big regulation person, but I think that that's gonna be something that we're gonna to have to be thoughtful about. In April, two years ago, 2021, uh, the European Commission proposed a legal framework around this. And uh, you can, I think I've posted a link to that as well. You can begin to see the kinds of things that they're thinking about. Oh, it's in one of the videos, that's where it's at. So there is uh, going to be an important aspect of this is to identify where's the risk, what kind of requirements do we put in place, um, what kind of human oversight needs to be put in place, what kinds of things do we want to limit, are there things that we don't want AI to be involved in because we want humans to continue to do that even if maybe we're going to be less efficient than a quote-unquote system. And now let's talk about chat GPT. I know that you guys are aware of it and uh, it's the winter of 2022 that was uh, last November, December, just four or five months ago. And mark it down. Uh, this chat GPT is released and it takes off. It literally takes the world by storm. And uh, have you used it? I'm, I, I would suspect that you have. I've used it. I've used it in several ways to be more productive. I already mentioned that I had it write code for um, to see if it could solve a problem for my class. But I've also used it to get some tips on uh, some code I'm writing for a little program for my grandkids. A little game I'm writing for my grandkids. And I asked chat GPT, to put together a couple things so I could see how it would solve the problem. And I thought the code it wrote was very effective. I've used it for coming up with examples. I've asked it to come up with humorous examples for implementing C++ classes. And uh, it gave me some and I said, hey, I like those too. Could you give me more like those? And it gave me some more and I've actually used those in my classes. So it's, it's helped me find new examples and ways to explain things in my class. I uh, used it to get help with writing a recommendation letter for a student who was wanting to get into grad school. Uh, that was very, very useful. Um, I, on the on a humorous side, I played Dungeons and Dragons, have for over 40 years, and uh, I used it to give me a list of potential good names for a dwarven cleric who likes to play with fire. And it was quite humorous, and it came up with some really good names that I was quite surprised by. And I even used it to write this slide. I uh, I went to ChatGPT and said, what's happening with you? Uh, I didn't quite say it that way, but I basically prompted it to tell me about itself and what it sees. And so I, I brought a little bit of that in. So there are a ton of, pro these are all productivity improvements and there's nothing wrong with them. The, you know, we don't want to have, what we don't want is to replace your learning or my learning. What we want it to do is augment our activities. Um, 
And so that's the danger. If you begin to rely on it too much, then you actually are not learning anything yourself. So it's um, very, I think, very important for all of us. It's incumbent on us to continue to be intellectually engaged with these things. Um, the uh, part that I want to talk to you about, about OpenAI, and this is the company that does it, is that they intended it to be safe and they have put boundaries on it, but people have already broken those boundaries. And there's going to be, I think, a continued back and forth that's going to, in a way, simulate the back and forth that happens between hackers and people who try to protect networks, cybersecurity agents. There's a constant back and forth of hackers looking for weaknesses and cybersecurity agents trying to recognize what those weaknesses are and build patches and get them out to uh, different people. I think we're going to see the same thing here. Um, people are going to be looking for ways in which they can push this to do things that it wasn't intended to do, and some of those are not going to be ethical. And uh, I, you can go read the literature and find out what some of those are. Because AI is trained on such a huge body of knowledge, it has a lot of information. There are already some boundaries in place, but there are ways to get the chat GPT to ignore those boundaries. And that, so those have been published and the open AI people have said, okay, we're going to close those up, but you know, it's just going to be an arms race. There's always going to be somebody who finds a new way to get around the boundaries that are in place. And that seems to be human nature. There are people who are interested in trying to figure out where the boundaries are, how they can break them. Some of them are white hat people who are doing it for good reason. Some of them are black hat people. And uh, so we're going to see more of that happening and, uh, the chat GPT that has become readily available is a, a machine learning in that it learns from some of its experiencing. It has natural language processing and it was trained on a huge body of data, which gives it that LLL feature. All right. So that's what chat GPT is. We acknowledge it. Um, I hope that you guys are, are learning how to use it productively and wisely for yourself. And that's really the key is um, I, I want you to be aware of it. You should be aware of it because as a technology leader, you may be asking yourselves, how can we imp use this inside of our own company? Um, and finally, uh, we have a slide here about AI and today. And if you look over there on the right side of the slide, um, this drawing that is here of this person, this kind of robotish thing looking at the uh, um, computer is a doll E tool uh, drawing that I, I went to doll E2, D A L L E 2. You can Google that. And it's an AI painter. And I said, Hey, give me a picture of a technology leader who is looking at their computer and wondering about artificial intelligence. And they are confused by it. And it gave me four prompts and I picked this one. So this is my picture in 10 seconds. I had a custom diagram. Uh, I mean, a custom image. Uh, painted by AI that I could use in my lecture. And uh, so that's the kind of thing you can do. I think if you sign up for the Dolly 2 tool, you get 50 free pictures and then a certain amount of pictures every month for free. And I have used it several times to entertain my grandkids and again, make images for lectures and things like that. Uh, you as a leader, you should not be ignored, ignoring this technology. It is, we are literally, I think at an inflection point, it's going to take off very fast. And you should be asking, how can you use AI to improve processes, to improve productivity of employees and organizations, or to improve customer interactions? And you should be thinking about what kind of AI will help you the most, um, and what will the cost of that be? Um, you need to be the leader in terms of recognizing that there are ethical implications. We're in the early stages of this, and so there are gonna be, there's going to be a lot of learning. You should keep up with that. If AI is relying on big data sets, if it gives you information um, that's copyrighted, what does that mean? This picture over here the, of this person, it, the AI system was able to create that picture by borrowing on images from millions of other images in its library. Well, what if some of the images it borrowed on were copyrighted? Who owns that? Do I owe that person something? Same thing for uh, when AI systems write code for people. They are actually drawing on example codes, often from public um, uh, public use licenses. Well, those still have licenses associated with them. We're still working through how to figure that out, how to figure out how that licensing is going to be brought forward into the code that was, quote, copied. 
so there's a lot of lot of questions out there about ethics and um, and how we're going to resolve that. You'll also be thinking about what skills and expertise your organizations need. And finally, we'll look at technology life cycles in a, in a couple of weeks. But finally, where is AI at in its technology life cycle? And that may have an impact on you know how we think about it and how we use it. Anyway, AI to me is a fantastic opportunity. As I mentioned, we are literally, I think, at the beginning of a, of a new frontier that is going to have massive impact across the board. And uh, so it's, it's a great time to be alive, great time to see this kind of thing. I hope you're optimistic about it, but I also hope that you recognize the opportunity that is in front of you as a um, new leader going into the future. How can you use this thing? How can you lead your organization to use it? All right, good luck. Uh, whack out the next uh, uh, homework assignment and uh, then one more module and there will be an online uh, quote unquote homework. And that uh, we'll talk about that more in a future PowerPoint.